Coming up on DTNS, goodbye Harmony remotes, but hello, new Apple smart speakers, maybe. Plus, NVIDIA takes on Intel with supercomputer CPUs, while Intel moves into NVIDIA's space in autonomous cars. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, April 12th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And joining us from the Big Apple, New York City, it's CNET Senior Editor, Ayaz Akhtar! Hey, hey everybody, hey. welcome to Monday, the greatest day that's ever existed since Monday. Exactly, exactly. We were just talking about uh, going to see a baseball game in real life, going to do that tomorrow. Uh, we were talking about all kinds of good stuff on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Alibaba's fintech affiliate Ant Group agreed to a rectification plan and will become a financial holding company, meaning it will now be subject to the same regulations as banks in China. It will now need to reduce the size of its money market fund, which is one of the world's largest. And Ant will also provide users more payment options and stop practices that lure users into getting loans. Alibaba itself will pay $2.8 billion fine for antitrust violations related to restrictions on merchants selling goods on other shopping platforms. Updated Apple support documents show the company made mid-production hardware changes to the A12, A13, and S5 processors in autumn 2020 to update the secure storage component. This second-generation component includes counter lock boxes, which would seemingly mitigate password cracking devices like GrayKey. Microsoft intends to acquire the cloud and AI software and services company Nuance for $19.7 billion, its second largest acquisition, expected to close by the end of this year. The two companies formed a strategic partnership back in 2019 to deliver ambient clinical intelligence technologies and have worked to integrate Nuance's Dragon Medical AI Assistant platform into Azure services. Nuance's software formed the basis of Apple's Siri voice assistant in its early days before Apple switched to its own system. The Federal Communications Commission of the United States released the FCC Speed Test app for iOS and Android. It'll use speed test data to inform its efforts to collect accurate broadband speed information and aid broadband deployment. Current FCC broadband coverage maps are built from self-reported data from the ISPs. Google and Apple blocked an update to the NHS COVID-19 contact tracing app, which would have prompted users to upload logs of venue check-ins if they tested positive for the virus. The terms of Google and Apple's exposure notification API used by the NHS app states that users must not share location data from the user's device with the public health authority, Apple, or Google. All right, <clears throat> let's talk a little more about Logitech Remotes. Logitech announced it will no longer manufacture Harmony Remotes, uh, famous for making really good universal remotes. Although Logitech says support and software updates will continue, including adding new supported devices. They're, they're not going to just freeze it where it is. They're going to do security updates. New stuff comes along. They're going to add it to the database. The company said it does not see the move impacting current customers and plans, quote, to keep service running as long as customers are using it. Harmony remotes have been around since 2001. Uh, you might remember them as Easy Zapper. Uh, that was what the company was called in 2001. It changed its name to Intrigue Technologies when the Harmony remotes became uh, really popular uh, and then sold to Logitech in 2004. So it's been part of Logitech ever since then. Uh, I was talking to Patrick Norton over the weekend about this, and he said that a lot of the professional installers out there that do like high-end home stereo installations have been courted by Logitech to put in Logitech stuff into their installations, including Harmony Remotes, and Logitech won't want to spoil those relationships. So it's likely that Logitech will keep its word on providing support because it wants to maintain good relationships with installers. At least that, that was Patrick's theory, and it makes sense to me. Uh, but it is the end of an era, and possibly signaling uh, a change in how people are using their devices if Logitech doesn't see this as a worthwhile business. Yeah, I've never had a Harmony remote, and you know, it was not that long ago that people were saying, Sarah, you have four remotes. You think you need all of them, and you just need the Harmony remote. It's the best thing you'll ever buy. Never got around to it. I just kind of had my system. Now, because, it, well, my TV is, is, well, I have voice 
uh, control my television uh, or I use my Apple TV remote. My TV remote has gone somewhere. Uh, don't even know where my uh, where my uh, receiver remote is because I don't need that either. It really is perhaps something where Harmony just doesn't feel that people have this need as much anymore. Certainly, there are a lot of people out there saying, well, I do, and I like my Harmony remote, and I'm glad that they're not uh, discontinuing um, software updates. But, but yeah, it, it might indicate where this is all going. Yeah, I'm one of those people. Like, I'm just when I saw the headline, I was like, oh, no, what do I do? Because my, my tech setup is a little bit more... Um, cheap and put together in a way that it doesn't make it super easy, but the Harmony kind of takes away all those sins because you can have one button that switches from your AV receiver and then also turns on your uh, HDMI switch to get everything all working at the same time. I liked how it really kept things away from certain users. If you're like, hey, yeah, you're you're five, just hit hit the button on the right. It'll work. Everything will work. Don't worry about knowing about AV1 and knowing that the game is this way and then this is, we're using CEC on another thing like that it was all behind the scenes. But Sarah, as you mentioned it, when it comes to all the voice control stuff, I find myself using Google home products, using Alexa devices a lot when it comes to control, but the harmony has been that little middle ground, the little bridge that can make it all happen. I'm really hoping that there's going to be some form of continuation when it comes to other universal remotes. CEC is quite good. You can control devices through your HDMI cables as long as they're connected in a chain. I just don't know how great they are when you have a really complicated setup. Uh, either I got to get simpler or I got to find a better product. Yeah, I, I'm like you. I, I have a Harmony hub uh, that kind of controls all my multiple stuff. Uh, and I, I haven't actually touched the actual remote part of that system uh, since we moved, maybe. Like, I, you know, when I put it in the dock, uh, I, just, I just rely on the Harmony hub to interact with Amazon Echo uh, to control all that stuff. So... I, I, I can see where Logitech is coming from, and I can see that a lot more devices are working directly with voice assistants, whether it's Google, Amazon, or something else. Uh, so so it may be that they're just not seeing as many people buying this. It's become a, a much more of a niche product than it was you know, even a couple of years ago. Well, NVIDIA announced a whole lot of things. <laughs> At its GPU technology conference, it announced a CPU. NVIDIA has developed an energy-efficient ARM-based CPU called Grace, named after computer scientist Grace Hopper. Grace is a data center CPU powered by ARM Neoverse cores and tightly integrated with NVIDIA GPUs meant for supercomputer-level AI, including natural language processing. It uses 4th gen NVIDIA NVLink for 900 gigabyte per second connections between the CPU and GPU, 30 times faster than today's leading servers. NVIDIA said Grace is 10 times faster at nat natural language processing than its x86 based DGX servers. The Swiss National Computing Center Apps supercomputer, built by H HP Enterprise and the US Department of Energy's Los Alamos National Laboratory, will both use Grace powered systems when they launch in 2023. But that's not all. NVIDIA also announced an ARM. If an ARM. Energy efficient, sorry, somebody did something in this in this rundown and tripped me up. NVIDIA also announced an ARM high performance computing developer kit with an Ampere Antra CPU, two NVIDIA A100 GPUs, and two NVIDIA Bluefield 2 DPUs aimed at faster networking, security, and storage. The US Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Los Alamos National Lab, and Taiwan's National Center for High Performance Computing are the first customers for that. And NVIDIA announced a partnership with AWS to integrate NVIDIA GPUs with Amazon's ARM-based Graviton 2 processor to run Android apps natively and stream games to mobile devices. On the business workforce front, NVIDIA announced a new line of Pro Ampere CPUs for workstations, the RTX A5000 and A4000 GPUs for desktops, and the A2000 and A4000 GPUs for laptops. There are also T1200 and T600 GPUs based on the multitasking-oriented Turing architecture and new A10 and A16 GPUs for data centers. Closer to most of our homes, though. NVIDIA is partnering with MediaTek on a reference laptop platform for Chromium, Linux, and NVIDIA SDKs. MediaTek will simplify its ARM chips to work with NVIDIA GPUs, and obviously this could show up in Chromebooks, but also in game devices, smart TVs, and more. 
Yeah, like you said, a lot of announcements there, and I apologize. I'm the one who edited Alps. Uh, in Don't the, in do the that read while I'm <laughs> reading. Free off. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the uh, um, the the main line here though is that Nvidia is making a CPU. It's not the first time it's made a CPU, but it's making a CPU for data centers that directly wants to get company big big companies to spend money when they're building supercomputers with nvidia uh that is nvidia moving even farther away from just being a, a gpu company uh to being a full-on chip company that provides high-end chips uh to enterprise uh and that that's a big deal uh nvidia is really good at this stuff and and so uh i would expect that you don't get uh, the Swiss National Computing Center or the Los Alamos National Laboratory to sign on unless you've really showed that, that you've got a energy efficient uh, CPU that can do what those enterprises need to do. In addition to that, it's ARM based, right? Uh, this, this is another uh, chink in the wall uh, against Intel where ARM can say, we have, su we have more supercomputers running on ARM now because of NVIDIA. Yeah, I saw this news and I was like, okay, what's going on? I saw that the CNBC was reporting that Intel was stock was taking a hit based on the news, which is not that surprising because Intel does have a stronghold when it comes to data centers. And if NVIDIA is coming after it, that should be frightening to any investor in general because NVIDIA can be quite aggressive. I mean, when it comes, when it comes to power and efficiency, they're really good at it. When I think about something like the Tegra 1, this thing came out years ago. It's still powering the NVIDIA Shield, and it's still as fast as ever. It's still powering the Nintendo Switch. So even when NVIDIA is like just kind of tinkering with something, they can have a product that'll work for way many years than I think that was even anticipated. When it comes to Intel stuff, you know, you're really, you're really looking at cycles. You're trying to wonder if, will this survive? Can I use this regularly? If NVIDIA is coming after data centers, like Intel has got to figure something out quickly. Yeah, we have something coming up a little later in the show that may indicate one of the things that they're trying to, to figure out. Uh, but first, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman's sources say Apple is working on a couple of new smart home devices. One of them, a HomePod speaker that includes Siri, of course, and the functions of an iPad. So it's a HomePod with a screen. Uh, the screen might be mounted on a movable arm, uh, described as a robotic arm that could automatically follow your face during video calls, similar to the new Echo Show, uh, or, you know, just be adjusted for better viewing angles. Uh, the other device he says is coming is an Apple TV with an integrated smart speaker. It would have all the normal Apple TV functions, but also include a speaker that could be used even when the TV is off, as well as a mic and camera. That means you could ask Siri to do things, presumably all the normal things you might ask Siri, plus Apple TV specific things like launch a particular app or watch a particular show. Camera would be useful for video calls on the TV as well. So they're thinking, oh, if you've got this hooked up to your TV, maybe you're gonna talk to grandma and the kids or, or whatever. These products are in development. So final features and whether either device will ship is still not determined. This is German saying, my sources say they're working on them. Doesn't mean they're gonna ship them. Apple did recently discontinue the original HomePod though, and and uh, previous reports indicated a new Apple TV with a redesigned remote control was expected sometime this year. So maybe these are products that would follow on those uh, ex expected announcements in a year or two. But but the kind of thing that I, I think raises an eyebrow, because people have been wondering, why can't Siri do more and why is the HomePod so limited? This indicates that Apple at least is thinking along the lines of, of making more functional smart speakers. You know, when I first got the Echo Show, uh, and that was for a Live With It segment, and I've come to love it a lot, I I was, I had to kind of <laughs> train myself not to keep wanting to pick it up and take it with me somewhere. You know, it's, you plug it in, you leave it there, you pick the right spot, and that's where it lives. You know, you can talk to it from, you know, certain areas, but if you want to touch it or look at text, you kind of got to be right there. So I was like, an iPad that you don't take with you and sit on the couch with unless there's a perfect spot right next to the couch where you can, you know, look at all your apps and, and do things with an iPad. My first reaction was like, oh, that seems annoying. You'd have to be in a perfect spot. But there's probably a lot of people who are like, most of the time my iPad is docked on my desk or, you know, in this convenient place for me. So in that sense, it would be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you're going to have an iPad that's stuck, let's say it's it's based on iOS or something similar to that, uh, with Apple's, I guess, renewed interest in widgets, 
I think that could be a really helpful thing for something like an iPad. So you have this glanceable information. Instead of just sticking with these tiny icons, you can see the weather really large, or you can see sections of your house through the home app or other ways that would be better on a larger screen. I've had, uh, I have yet to get a smart display in my house. I have a bunch of smart speakers, but I don't really think I need one of these devices. I think it makes a lot of sense for Apple to do it because some of the commands for Siri, I think, are a little bit strange. They're hard to figure out. I think you could have a lot more teaching involved when you have a screen on there. And also, they have a great supply chain. So when it comes to using old displays that you would never want on an iPad, you know, you're not really worried about like how close is the digitizing layer to the actual glass. You're not worried about that on a HomePod display. You're worried about that on a phone or an iPad. So maybe they can use some of this cheaper tech to make these speakers stand out in a way that would be different from the competition. But again, you got Alexa and Google out there, or Amazon and Google, with really polished products at this point. I, I think these show uh, that Apple has been thinking logically about this product line. Uh, an app, don't think about it as adding speakers to an Apple TV. Think about it as a HomePod mini complemented by a HomePod with Apple TV functions that you could hook up to your, your, your TV. Think of it as a speaker that can also act as an Apple TV. And you see Roku doing this as well, putting out speakers that have Roku functionality in it. And and same goes for, for that, that display. The smart display, I don't think they want you to think of it as an iPad that stays in one place. They want you to think of it as a HomePod with a screen. And when I think about it that way, the idea of having some iPad functionality in there is very appealing. I've, I've got an original Echo Show, and we use it in the kitchen. It's great. We watch Netflix on it. We listen to music on it. We do recipes on it, play YouTube on it. But it's limited. It's limited in what it can do. And sometimes you have to remember, like, okay, how do I get it to play the thing off Hulu? I have to say it exactly right. Being able to just have all the iOS apps available on this, granted, maybe it won't, but if it did, uh, it would be leaps and bounds more functional than either the Echo Show or the Google Smart Displays, I think. The only one thing about the Apple TV that would have smart speaking capabilities is, you know, I, I look forward to a new Apple TV. I don't even have the latest Apple TV. Um, I'm one gen behind. So, you know, I'm, and I'm hoping for a, a better remote. Maybe it'll look like the Harmony remote. My Apple TV is mounted behind my television, and it has been for years. One Somebody who, you know, installed a TV on my wall at some apartment years ago was like, do you want me to just hide this with some Velcro? You've got room. And I was like, that's awesome, you know, as long as the remote still works, which it does. So I'm like, the, the camera is actually kind of a neat idea since I talk remotely with people a lot more often than I used to, and it would be pretty cool to sit on my couch and see them large on the TV but then my Apple TV would have to be placed differently. It's a little thing, but something I think probably other people would would have issues yeah, yeah. with too. But it would look like speakers, so maybe it wouldn't be as big of a deal. Cause yeah, it, but it's nice you know. to just not see it, and it just yeah. is there. You know, it makes it feel like it's just the part of the TV. Well, folks. Uh... What do you want to hear us talk about on the show? Uh, we could talk about all kinds of good technology stuff every day. One way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Today's a good day for autonomous car companies to announce what they're going to be doing in the next couple of years. Intel's Mobileye will partner with Udelve to launch a full-scale, fully driverless, last-mile delivery service by 2023. The service will use a cabinless vehicle. In other words, there's nowhere for people inside. It's called the Transporter. Mobileye and Udelf plan to produce 35,000 of them between 2023 and 2028. Transporters will have a 65 mile an hour top speed and use Mobileye's self-driving system, which includes 13 cameras, three long range LIDARs, six short range LIDARs, and six radar, and be equipped with a data crowdsourcing program called the Road Experience Management System to use real time data to build out a global 3D map. Meanwhile, GM's Cruise struck a deal to become the exclusive operator of a robo-taxi service in Dubai between 2023 and 2029. The Cruise Origin shuttles operate at highway speeds with no steering wheel or pedals. Cruise plans to scale to 4,000 vehicles by 2030. And if you don't want to wait until 2023, Domino's announced that customers near one of its restaurants in Houston can start requesting deliveries from a self-driving Neuro R2 autonomous car. It's the only vehicle allowed in the U.S. by the Department of Transportation to operate with no human controls. 
during limited time periods, if you live near the restaurant, you can request a robo delivery. Uh, not everybody gets them, but if you are selected, Domino's will give you a pin to unlock the chamber on the car when it arrives with your pizza. Neuro has been operating autonomous grocery deliveries in parts of Houston and Arizona for years. They're very experienced in this. Uh, we've talked about Neuro on the show before. They do deliveries for Kroger uh, in a few places like, like Houston and Arizona. So uh, an, a, a, a near-term actual autonomous delivery from Neuro and a, and a couple here, one, one to carry passengers in Dubai uh, and another giving Intel uh, a little little room to move in on NVIDIA's autonomous car business to be like, hey, our mobile eye division is no slouch. Yeah, I don't know which one's cooler. Uh, you know, it might be pizza. I wish I lived in Houston. In fact, it's it, very difficult to find information on which Domino's location it is because it's only one. Uh, so says the press release, but it doesn't say which one. So if anyone knows, let me know because I got a friend in Houston and I want him to to try this out and 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 send back notes. But yeah, RoboTaxi service in Dubai, exclusive partner, starting in 2023. Uh, you know, it's a six year term, but uh, but that's exciting. Uh, I wish I knew somebody in Dubai who could check it out and let us know how it goes. By 2023, but, we might actually be able to travel there and, and try it, who knows? Indeed, yeah, it could be a, a DTNS meetup of sorts. But yeah, the, the transporting service kind of makes the most sense to me. Um, this, this is, this is going to make a big difference. Uh, the future is here or at least in two years. I mean, I don't know what it says about me that I'm more excited about the pizza than any, anything else. I know we're talking about <laughs> driverless cars and we got like cargo, uh, trucks that could change the world. We're talking about maybe, uh, changing where people are working. They're not going to be in the cabs of these vehicles. They'll be doing other jobs, but pizza showing up with nobody there. I mean, it takes away one of the things I've really disliked, which is human communication. So this is fantastic. <laughs> I absolutely love the idea of a robot showing up with, with, I want more of these. And I'm hoping that if you're watching right now and you get your kicks out of kicking robots, don't do that. Okay. You're going to ruin it for the rest of us. We need the robots to give us the food so we don't have to talk to each other. And that's very important. Varuna Singh in our Twitch chat uh, lives in Dubai and, and, and is skeptical because uh, there have been a lot of announcements in Dubai of autonomous stuff. But uh, honestly, striking it with Cruise is a big deal. Uh, and Cruise does have legitimate autonomous cars that could do this. Uh, the Cruise Origin is, is a real shuttle that is being tested. So uh, Varuna, uh, if there was an announcement in Dubai that seems like it might actually come to fruition, I, I, I'd put my money on this one. Uh, that said, I think the mobile eye is the most practical one, right? Uh, the Domino's is very limited, uh, whereas the mobile eye, that's about last mile delivery. Obviously, it's attended delivery because there's nobody in the truck to, to you know, bring the package to your doorstep. So you're probably going to have to come out and put in a pin or something like you do with the pizza. But that's that's uh, that is a real problem uh, that needs to be solved for, you know, grocery delivery or, or a lot of other things. And I think what this says is we're now getting more and more of these circling around in nearer terms. And even if they don't all come to fruition by 2023, we're getting closer to these becoming widespread and at scale. Well, the NFT craze has hit sports and sports entertainment, everybody. Tops will launch its first NFT-based baseball card collection, 2021 Top Series 1 Baseball NFT. On April 20th, coming right up, the MLB-approved cards will include themed animated backdrops and 3D team cubes and use the WAX blockchain. Meanwhile, the WWE held its first NFT auction for a four-tiered set of tokens that feature movements in the career of... The Undertaker, Ayaz, you're probably familiar. With a platinum tier, unique NFT going for $100,000, down to a bronze tier available for $100. I am familiar with this. They were running ads for Undertaker's NFTs during WrestleMania the weekend. If I was not in this sector, I would think this is a joke, right? <laughs> There's no way you're selling a video clip of The Undertaker doing something. But yes, they are. I, I honestly, I've, I've looked into this topic, the, the whole field of it. I find this to be like an emperor's new clothes kind of thing. I don't know how long this is going to last. This is like, I, but good on these, good on the companies for making money where they can. I, I still think this is just not, I think you're not investing in anything. That's a whole other issue. And we don't need to get into that. I'm sure there's many, many topics. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Discuss. No, we've, we've, we've definitely kicked around yeah. NFTs for, for several weeks now, like everybody else. Uh, but 
But I don't know, folks. I think this is this one's going to stick around uh, more than other people think. Obviously, the NBA is making a go of this, hence MLB and the WWE wanting to get in on it. Uh, I am a baseball card collector myself. Uh, but I prefer to stick with uh, buying old Burger Chef collectible baseball cards off of eBay. Uh, that is that is my <laughs> my my thing right now. But I'm I'm still positive about NFTs. I, I do think that NFTs are are going to stick around. I don't think they're a flash in the pan. We'll find out. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. A few people responded to our electric vehicle roundtable episode with questions about collision repairs. Allison Sheridan, who was on the panel, tells us. 11 days after I took custody of my Model 3, I was rear-ended. It was a bit more hassle because at least at the time, that was two years ago, you had to go to an authorized Tesla repair facility. It's not that you couldn't go to a non-authorized place, but they were prioritized so low in getting parts, you just never get your car fixed. That was definitely a shortage of parts back then, so not sure if that's still true. My repair took about a week, and the place that I needed to go was a very reputable body shop in my area that I had used years before with my Honda. It was a fascinating experience because the guy we worked with let us go on a tour. We got to see about 40 Teslas mid-repair, which made me think of going through a hospital ward in a battle zone. It was only there that I got a full appreciation of the battery underneath and what it takes to lift one of these cars. Good to know. Thank you, Allison, uh, for sharing that. Uh, there were so many good topics to get through on that roundtable. Uh, I, I know we missed a few topics, so keep those coming. I've been forwarding questions relating to the EV roundtable to Bodie, uh, and Bodie has said, I'll, I'll cover these on the Kilowatt uh, podcast. Also got an anonymous email uh, from someone who works for a trucking company that runs parts from suppliers to a major foreign automotive manufacturing plant in the United States, saying it was shut down the week of March 29th through April 2nd and will again be shut down from April 19th through the end of the month. I know the supplier that I go to ships primarily to the automaker that I deliver to. This shutdown is going to affect more than just the employees at the automotive manufacturing plant, but also most, if not all, the employees at the smaller parts manufacturing plants. Most, if not all, of the smaller suppliers can't afford to pay their employees when the supplier is not being paid to manufacture and ship parts. So, yeah, it, it definitely has uh, knock-on effects for sure. Got a lot of feedback over the weekend, and we love your feedback. If you have questions, comments, anything about past shows or future topics, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Thanks in advance. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Mike McLaughlin, Reed Fischler, and Mark Gibson. Also, special thanks to Patrick Cohn, who is in the top lifetime supporters for DTNS list. Thanks for all the years of support. Patrick Cohn. Also, big thanks to Ayaz Akhtar, our former co-host. So nice to have you back in the trifecta of greatness, if I do say so myself. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, thanks for having me. This was fantastic. I go to youtube.com slash CNET. My latest video is about LG. It's not really the rise and fall, because I don't really think they rose, but definitely also check out uh, CNET's video on the Optimus Prime robot that transforms itself. It's really cool. It's not my own video. I don't really care. It's really cool, so I say you should watch it. So youtube.com slash CNET. We are live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, and that's 20.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Seth Rosenblatt. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>